I took my place on the tailboard of a fire apparatus for the first time in June of 1985. Now, you would like to think that somebody who had been doing something for three decades would be an expert at it. But if we take this definition provided to us from the uh, nuclear physicist Niels Bohr, I really can't say I've made all the mistakes that can be made in our field. And while I have made my share, I think I have some room for growth. But if I may, for just a moment, talk about that other 75% of our job, EMS. You know, we see a lot of change in EMS. Protocols constantly changing. What was considered a best practice five years ago is now not even in the protocols. And uh, one of the most shocking examples of this for me personally was uh, in uh, CPR calls, the resuscitation calls. It, it, for years, and I, I'm one who takes a lot of pride in being a paramedic in addition to being a firefighter. For years, on these CPR calls, it was the ACLS drugs. It was the magic of the, the paramedic protocols that made the difference. And then uh, somebody came along, did some research, and found out that it was the chest compressions that was really making a difference on these calls and what was saving people. The basic chest compression done by the, the knuckle draggers on the truck company. Not, a, not the magic of us paramedics. And, you know, and if you take a lot of pride in what you do, it's a little shocking to have some of that maybe devalued a little bit. But you know, EMS is not something that we're really the experts at. Yes, it's a big part of the service we deliver, but at the end of the day, it's driven by the doctors, by the medical community. We're merely just the service delivery folks out there. But that's definitely not the case when it comes to structural firefighting. We are the subject matter experts. That is our profession. I mean, my agency, we've been at it since the 1880s. I would like to think that we're fairly mature in our tactics, our doctrine. I'm sure there's been evolutionary changes. Fire apparatus, SCBAs have gotten lighter, thermal imaging cameras, but by and large, the art and science of structural firefighting is highly developed and you wouldn't really expect much changes to be taking place this late in the game. And then these guys come along and they start doing full-scale burns in instrumented structures and they start getting data that well, we've never had before. And I remember my first exposure to this. There was a, a colleague of mine that was taking a, a graduate class. It was the uh, autumn of 2010 and he had this, it was fairly raw material at the time, on his laptop. And we gathered around firehouse kitchen table where we do all these things in the fire service. And he proceeded to show us this information. And there's about a half dozen of us looking at this on the laptop. And slowly as we're watching the time and temperature curves and all the other things that's happening from this research, we start looking around, uh, looking around at each other. And there's this moment of pause where we're, you know, guys, if some of this is true, then maybe some of the things we've been doing aren't quite correct. And so the meeting broke up. I continued to look at some of this information. And I started to look at it through the lens of some of the incidents that I've been involved with through the course of my career. And it occurred to me that, yes, I had routinely taken hose lines past fires in order to push the fire out of the building from the unburned side. And I, someone who had sworn an oath to protect the citizens of my city against the ravages of fire, had stood on an exposure line, charged line in hand, and not put water in a window when the interior attack crew bogged down due to hoarding conditions. And I did not put out that fire in that room for fear of the steam that would befall my comrades inside the building. And then uh, I thought about some of the ventilation practices I'd performed over the years. And there were some times where the fire sure did get, seem to get a hell of a lot bigger after some of the actions we'd taken than it was you know, the five minutes before when we first got it seen. And then there's the near misses. 
And um, I'm hesitant to use the term near miss. Because when you end up putting firefighters in the burn unit, I don't think, really think that's much of a miss. And one of these you may, you may recognize has gotten a fair amount of uh, exposure on social media. But in both of these instances that come to mind, the injuries that occurred to the firefighters were at the time attributed to the actions of uh, hose lines. And with what we were learning, not only did that not seem to be the case, in one of the two, the unpredicted and rapid fire growth occurred in a time frame that is absolutely predictable by the data from these studies. So here comes along all this information, 20 some odd years into my career, and it's, I start to question some of the things I was learned. Yes, that's me, fresh from the academy at my first structure fire. Um, some of the information that was conveyed to me early on in my career and in the course of my career development. And, you know, there's really no other profession that I can think of that had some of their fundamental understandings changed quite this much all of a sudden. Perhaps the medical community, when they first developed germ theory in the 19th century, where they went from believing that cholera and malaria and other diseases were caused by bad odors and foul air and things like that. And they finally realized that germs were causing diseases and it totally changed the way physicians looked at the disease process. Well, much like us here in the fire service, all of a sudden we got some information that challenged what we had long held and believed. And really, I was forced to square myself with the reality that either the laws of physics were different in Northbrook, Illinois, and in Governor's Island, New York, than they were in Southern California, and fires just burned differently there than they did here, or this information was such that I had been doing some things on the fire ground that may not have, in fact, been the best thing to do. And when you look at fire behavior, you start to look at maybe some of the tactics that had, are, like most fire departments, our tactical doctrine had been developed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And so you start to doubt some of the tactics that had served us well for years. Well, fast forward now to about 2013. This information is starting to get broad distribution into the fire service. There's a lot of discussion happening, again, around the firehouse kitchen table in our fire stations. Well, our fire chief, in his wisdom, decided to uh, form a committee to uh, get, get our tactics looked at and what we've been doing in the light of this new information. And I fortunately was chosen to be a member of that committee. And what followed was about a six month process where myself and some of my colleagues <coughs> looked at what we were doing, what are the tactics that we had done for years. And when you start to take that deep introspection into yourselves and your fire department, it, it, can be dis it can cause some discomfort. It really does. But what we came up with in the end was a comprehensive fire behavior curriculum. We decided that we were, for really the first time ever, going to show our people what fire actually did, how fire actually behaved. And I can safely say, that the average recruit leaving our academy today has more and better fire behavior knowledge than I had when I was a newly promoted company officer. And yes, we made some tactical changes. We changed the way we changed from where and how we apply water to the fire. And we changed when and where we ventilate. But I'll tell you, we really found that we were doing a lot more right than wrong. And if you look at one of our fires today to one from five years ago, you're really not going to see a whole lot of difference. And yes, we still place an absolute premium on getting crews inside the structure to conduct search. And we still vertically ventilate, even though that tactic really has proven to be not all we once thought it was we still find it's the most effective way 
to get smoke out of a structure and create searchable space. The difference is, now I have data to support that. Instead of it just being some old truck captain thinking it was a good idea or that's just what we do. <clears throat> and that probably personally for me has been the biggest challenge with this new information. How we're making decisions based on data, cold analytical data. Not entirely, of course, but it does tip the art and science of firefighting away from the art and more towards the science. And it threatens to take some of the, uh, well, romance out of firefighting and, and dare I say, even some of the fun. And if we're going to be intellectually honest with ourselves, it's really tough to say that we should be having fun at, at the uh, taxpayer's expense. But I share this picture with you. This motley crew you see before you, this is from about 1978. I was in middle school at the time. But uh, this, this photograph, five of the gentlemen in this picture went on to become very influential uh, captains or chief officers during the course of my career. Also in this photograph is the last member of our fire department to die as a result of injuries received on the fire ground. And when you look at this information, you start to think, is it taking away from our culture, our heritage, our traditions? And we value those in the fire service, rightfully so. But really, these guys, I remember when I first came on, they had a, they had a more workmanlike approach to the job. They really did. I never heard them talking about heroics. I don't even think they thought, themselves, thought of themselves that way. They really looked at the job as there's a, there's a place on fire. It's my job to go in. That's what they pay me for. It, it was a much more, best I can say, is workmanlike way of looking at firefighting. And I think there was a lot to be said for that. You know, we do have the potential of letting our ego and our pride get in the way of this. And pride is one of those things that gives us tactical excellence. If you're proud in what you do, you're the guy that's going to be out there with your crew throwing ladders and uh, spending extra time on that roof prop, stretching hose lines. Pride can be a good thing, but can also get in the way of us looking at other information. So yes, there were some things I thought I knew about my profession. And some of that's changed. But a lot of it hasn't. And some things never will. The mission is going to remain the same. I don't think that will ever change. A good, fundamentally sound, well-trained crew is always going to win the day. And at the end of the, in the end, it's our, core val it's our core values of service, preparedness, and sacrifice that create our corporate culture. Thank you.